<clears throat> hey everyone, it's Suja. I hope you're doing well. I'm with Lux Capital and I just hosted our monthly meetup and I've already gotten several requests for the replay, but guess what? I forgot to record the meeting. So anyways, I am going to um, go ahead and re-record the content because um, you know, I think we can get through it pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, I really want you guys to have that information out there. So I am, let's see, going to go ahead and get started. So this is a replay or redo of the second Lux Wealth Conversations. And this is a series, a monthly meetup where I meet up with um, investors who are part of the Lux family and people who are new to the Lux family. Um, we drink a beverage. I'm drinking a soda water now. And um, the topic of today's investment is demystifying the alternative investing landscape. And I'm really excited about this particular topic because I think it really creates a framework for which investors can learn to understand how to get smarter at investing and where they want to begin to expand and begin to start moving their money um, if they're thinking about wanting to get out, you know, diversify outside of the normal stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. So um, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So um, table of contents, this is just kind of what we're going to go over. We're going to talk about, I'll just tell you who I am, and then we're going to talk about allocation to alternative investments, because the reality is that the wealthy folks in this country, the ultra wealthy and pension funds and life insurance companies, they invest much differently than the average investor. And um, then we are going to um, talk about those differences. And, you know, the whole goal of this is to help everyday investors feel smarter at investing um, so that they can emulate the strategies of the ultra wealthy and get better returns and less volatility because that's why the ultra wealthy are investing differently than the average investor. Um, we're gonna talk about my purpose, the three buckets of alternative investments that the institutional investors, pension funds, and you know, life insurance companies and banks and um, ultra wealthy families, family offices, the three main buckets that they invest in. Um, one of those buckets is passive real estate. We're going to dive into that in depth. And that is the area that Lux Capital focuses on is passive real estate. Um, we're going to talk about residential versus commercial and how those two um, buckets are different and what the key difference is between them. And then we're going to talk about risk versus returns, risk adjusted returns. And um, finally, we're going to talk about income versus growth deals because investors want different things out of investments based on what they are, what's happening in their lives. So that's a little overview. My name is Suja. I am, live in Portland, Oregon. I have a background in institutional investing. So buying and underwriting apartment buildings for institutional buyers. So I've been in the space since 2010. I'm also a real estate investor. I've done everything, many things in real estate, including flipping, including short-term rentals, long-term rentals, um, development, and, um, you know, I eventually wanted to put that money to work and I never really trusted the stock market. That's not to say that, you know, other people can trust the stock market, but personally I just didn't. And so I wanted to figure out how to put my money to work in a way that was intelligent and conservative and, uh, profitable. So that all those paths led me to syndication investing which is the passive real estate arm, which we're going to get to. Um, okay, just the pictures of me. You may have seen these before. This is me and my partner, Ben. This is me and my mom. This is, uh, we like to spend a lot of time outdoors. And all right, let's get into the fun stuff. So allocation to alternatives. So this slide compares the average investor's allocation to alternative investments Um compared to Tiger 21. So Tiger 21 is a um, group of people. It's an exclusive group. You've got to have $10 million of investable assets in order to be in Tiger 21. And they gathered a lot of data from their investors. It's about $70 billion worth of assets that they are um, getting data on. And let's look at how the difference between um, 
the Tiger 21 portfolio and the average mm -hmm. investor's portfolio. So the average investor invests 95% in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, and only 5% in alternatives. Tiger 21, on the other hand, invests only 22% in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, and the rest is in alternative assets or cash equivalents. So the main categories that we're going to end up looking at today are passive real estate, which is 27.3%, private equity, which is about 26%, and hedge funds. Um, and by private equity, we mean venture capital slash private equity. Um, you know, just to clarify something, passive real estate can also be called private equity. But when, when we're talking about it in the context of this conversation, it's mostly referring to venture capital and hedge funds. So um, these are just like slightly different types of asset classes. They don't really fall into the um, alternative investment category. But the point here is that at Tiger 21, they've got, you know, at least 50% or and more allocated to alternative investments. So that is one example of how the average investor invests much differently than the ultra wealthy. Okay, next, I'm gonna talk about some other examples of um, folks that invest differently than um, the average investor. So Ernst & Young did a survey of their ultra wealthy clients and they found that um, those folks were 75% in alternatives. They were 25% approximately in passive real estate, 25% in hedge funds, and 25% in venture capital. So that's 75% in alternatives, which is obviously vastly different than the average investor. Um, next, let's talk about the Yale endowment fund. So Yale was one of the first endowments to kind of um, go a different direction than a lot of other endowments and institutional investors. Three decades, decades ago, they started allocating more and more of their um, funds into alternatives. And they now have 97.5% in alternatives and only 2.5% in US equities or stocks. So um, that's obviously an incredible statistic. And Yale has done very, very well with their endowment. So um, taking a cue from them, I think it, you know, obviously I want to be more in alternatives. Um, and then the last category is just generally pensions and endowments. So if you look at those, our research shows that pensions and endowments are about 28% on average in alternatives. Again, a much higher allocation than the average investor. So what does this all tell us? It just basically tells us that this information isn't really out there for average investors to feel comfortable and confident investing in alternative asset classes. And that's really my goal um, is to help make it possible for the little person to feel comfortable investing in alternative asset classes. So over the course of this series, you know, my goal is to help investors understand what are these asset classes that are alternatives? What does Alt Street look like when you walk down it? Um, how do they work? What are the pros and cons? Because, you know, everything has pros and cons. It's not all, uh, you know, sunshine and roses, but that doesn't mean, but, you know, there's, so we want to just talk about that and figure out, okay, well, what are the cons and how do we address them, right? How do we mitigate? That's really the secret in real estate. How do we find these alternatives? How do we do due diligence? Um, what about timing? Because, you know, one of my passions is economic trends and understanding market dynamics and making sure that we're investing according to the times. There are some types of investments that are generally, you know, relatively insulated from market dynamics, but we always need to be aware of timing and how these external factors, inflation, interest rates, what the Fed is doing with monetary policy, how that is affecting our investment choices um, so that we can just capture um, the most tailwinds and be aware of any sort of challenges that are coming our way and invest optimally for the times. Um, and what are the big players doing, right? So helping the average person understand what are the big players doing so that we can play that game too and build wealth. And I'm just really passionate about everyday people building wealth because we need that for an equitable society. We need that for um, to build a strong middle class, upper middle class. And you know the way things are going right now, we are not really headed in that direction. The gap between the ultra wealthy and the rest of us is getting bigger and bigger. And you know it's one of my passions in life to help the average person um, become wealthy. Okay. So what are the challenges? Why do average 
investors not invest in alternative investments? Well, there's a lack of education and then there's a lack of access. So there's a lot to know about these types of investments, right? Like it's not like you can just um, snap your fingers and feel confident that you know what you're doing and that you know where to put your money. So there's a lot to know. That being said, it's also not rocket science, but there is a lot to know and be aware of. Um, my goal is to pull the covers off so that it's not so hard to understand, that it's more approachable, and that so that people can feel confident knowing how to win with alternatives. And I think another important thing to note is that this space has really grown in the last 10, 12 years. And that's because in 2012, there was some legislation passed that opened this world up to um, every, uh, you know, to to the wider world. So that was the Jobs Act of 2012. And what that did is it made it um, legal to advertise these types of passive real estate investments. Prior to 2012, you literally had to know somebody in order to take advantage of these opportunities. And so that meant you had to be in the same country club, you had to be in the same um, social network. And if you weren't, then you didn't have access to this type of investing, which is just, you know, absolutely mind blowing. Right. But thankfully things are changing and regular everyday people do have access to this now. So, um, let's see, that's the wrong slide. Okay. So who is this presentation for, and who is it that I am trying to serve? So I'm trying to ser serve high earners as one group and or sophisticated investors. So high earners slash sophisticated investors are people who've built up their net worth and or have high income. Um, I'm also looking to serve accredited investors. So just to break that down for a second, there's these terms um, in this space, sophisticated investor versus alternative accredited investor. So an accredited investor you've got to meet one of two criteria. You've got, are either have to have a million dollars in net worth outside of your primary home, or you've got to have 200 or $300,000 worth of income, 300,000 if you're married, 200,000 if you're single um, of income every year. So um, one thing that you know I pride myself on is I work with sophisticated investors as well as accredited investors. I really want sophisticated investors who are to be able to grow their wealth so that they can become an accredited investor. I worked my way up from sophisticated investor to accredited invest investor by investing in real estate. And, you know, it's really powerful what this kind of investing can do. And I want other people to have access to that as well. So most people who have become, have grown their net worth um, by investing in their 401k, um, by being high income earners. And most of these people have like somehow become exposed to this way of investing and want to learn more, right? And so that's really where I fit in is I want to help those people get more comfortable with this type of investing. And these folks usually want some kind of diversification, right? Um, diversification from markets, like from the economic trends, because, you know, what happens in the most of the time is people's net worth goes up and down with the economy. It literally just goes up and down because your the value of your house goes might go up and down um, with the economy, depending, you know, certain cycles are different, but oftentimes it does. And then also the value of their 401ks and their retirement portfolios and just their stock portfolios is going up and down with the economy. It's correlated. Well, when you invest in alternatives, you can actually invest in non-correlated assets. And so, you know, personally, I don't, I sleep like a baby even right now when there's um, economic uncertainty, because I know that I'm invested in uncorrelated assets and I have incredible confidence in my deals. And I just don't really worry about what's happening in the stock markets and what, you know, Elon Musk is tweeting or something like that, you know, or what's happening with the war in Ukraine. Obviously, these are things to be aware of, generally speaking, and they inform my investment decisions going forward. But overall, because I have this diversified investment portfolio into alternatives, and I've carefully studied what to put my money into, I, I sleep very well at night. So, um, and that's something that a lot of people want, want more is they want financial peace of mind. Um, and they also want their investment portfolios to become a stream of income for them, rather than just growing, you know, watching the chart go up of your stock portfolio and saying like, oh, now my net worth is, is 
X or Y or Z, like actually turn that into an income stream. Um, and the other, the other kind of person that I'm looking to work with is the active real estate investor. So these are people who have done well in real estate. They've maybe had rentals or had a small multifamily, and maybe they're looking to not hold the reins anymore. They want to hand the reins over to somebody else, but still invest in real estate because they understand real estate. They like it, but you know, they're kind of ready to not be active anymore. And, you know, they believe in real estate and generally speaking, and don't necessarily want to put that money into the stock market. Um, so my goal is to help make the world of alternative investing approachable to those folks as well. So if you're not in one of those categories, never fear. Hopefully this is still interesting to you. Or if not, then, you know, I get it. And feel free to just let someone else know about this if you think it might be interesting to them. Okay. So I always make sure to tell people earn, invest, repeat. So earn is when you earn money and you build up that those streams of income. Um, and then you you invest. And that's really the area that I focus on with Lux is putting that money to work in an efficient, risk-adjusted way. And then repeat. So it's really important to just keep that cycle going. So I am not currently focused on helping people earn. You can do that either through increasing your salary or developing other income streams like a side hustle or another business line. Um, and then you know, my goal is to help people invest that hard-earned money intelligently. And then you repeat, right? And once you get that cycle going, then you can really get your income to snowball. Okay, so, um, you know, we kind of are part of this. We're going to talk about overall in this series, we're going to learn from others' experiences. We're going to talk about how to do due diligence. And we're going to talk about where to find these opportunities to invest in um, passive real estate. Uh, but before that, let's get into um, the alternative continuum, okay? So this is kind of like an investment continuum. What are the levels of investing? So level one is stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. This is where most people begin and where most people stay. Uh, but not, you know, not you, you're here, right? So you want to level up. Maybe you've already done active real estate. DIY active real estate is what I call level 1.5. So that's when you actually own real estate and when you are... Uh, the person who's responsible for making sure the mortgage is paid and you know if the roof leaks you're the one who has to fix it so even if you have a property manager you're still doing active real estate um and a lot of people start here when they want to you know expand their investment horizon i certainly started here i bought my first rental house uh, my first flip with my student loans when i was in college and you know i did a lot of active real estate investing i still do it's an, it's an amazing in way to earn if you focus on cash flowing assets. Um, um, it's not so easy to scale, but it is an amazing way to earn. So the next level is passive real estate investing. Um, and passive real estate investing is when you are invested in real estate, but you let other people run the deal. So we're going to mostly focus on this. This is where I, with Lux, focus my energies and that's because it matches my risk return profile or what I'm willing to do and from a risk profile and the returns that I want to achieve. Um, the ultra wealthy also invest in venture capital and hedge funds. And those are, you know, level three and level four, I would say. And so um, personally, I choose to focus in level two, uh, but, you know, I'm learning more and more about these two. And it may be something that I decide to take on as I progress but uh, for right now, I just really love passive real estate investing in 100% of my investable assets outside of, you know, a very small retirement er, portfolio that's like a legacy portfolio are in the deals that we do. Okay, so we're also going to talk about, you know, pros and cons of all these types of investments, right? And we're going to talk about, I already mentioned the uncorrelated risk adjusted returns. So a lot of times people want to be like, well, what are the returns going to be? And we can tell you what the returns are going to be, but it's also really important to cut, to understand, well, what's the risk that I'm taking in order to achieve those returns? Um, and one thing I love about passive real estate is that it is uh, risk adjusted where, you know, we can mitigate against a lot of the risks, mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. That is the number one rule in real estate is that because we have these, um, you know, we have these projects, we can directly choose, you know, who's operating them, where they are 
we can go in with eyes wide open and then when things happen we can we can actually take the reins and drive the ship and make sure that it's going in the right direction and that's something that you can't do as much in the markets right because the markets are subject to mm, investor sentiment and market volatility and you can't always control what's happening in the markets and you you know that's not to say that we can control everything with real estate but we have a lot more control um, I think it's important to address Ponzi schemes. You know, these get a lot of high profile cases. There's a lot of high profile cases. I know people who've lost money um, with bad actors. And so it's really important to know how to avoid that. At the same time, it is like a very, it's a minority, but you know, who you invest with is important. So that's something that, you know, we will cover over time. And lastly, just want to note that like one of the main drawbacks that people talk about with passive investing um, and alternative investing is illiquidity. So is that a pro or is that a con? Well, you know, sometimes people need liquidity, but how much liquidity do people need? And is liquidity ever a downside? And in my belief, it is a downside because, because investors are essentially emotional people. Even if we want to think we're making logical decisions, overall, investors are still making emotional decisions. That's why the stock market crashes, right? Because everybody sells and they're making an emotional decision. They want to get out. And um, when you're in real estate, it's not so easy to sell. You can't just exit a property super quickly. So what that leaves us with is we need to manage the asset through any sort of volatility. And then when we come out at a, another time, we can, um, when it's an opportune time, we can sell the asset and make sure that it's positioned for profit, right? So I think that illiquidity is, is you know, it can be seen as a negative, but it's also a benefit. It's a benefit because it, it makes you stay in the asset and not be able to exit emotionally. A lot of times people, there's an age old saying, it's not timing the market, it's time in the market. And I think that that, you know, Sure, you can apply that to stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, or but um, you can also apply it to real estate, right? Like if you just let it do its work and you you know manage the asset well, then it will eventually work. And there's a lot more to how to mitigate risk, and we're going to talk about that. But anyway, so that's my thoughts on illiquidity. Okay, so now um, you know we talked about the three major buckets that alternative that constitute the alternative investing space. There's hedge funds. Well, there's level one, which is passive real estate. I think that's level two. Level three is venture capital, which is investing in you know early stage companies. And then level four is hedge funds. So today we're going to focus on passive real estate. So let me first break that down. It's in two basic categories, residential and commercial. Um, we're going to do commercial on the next slide. So We've also got some miscellaneous. So what's included in passive real estate residential? We've got regular long-term rentals. You know, when you buy into a fund that somebody else manages, you can do long-term rentals. You can also do short-term rentals on a kind of one-off basis. So um, you can also do hard money lending. Oftentimes that looks like when somebody is uh, lending money to a flipper and then the flipper, um, it, the deal is collateralized by the house and you can often charge like maybe 14 or 16 percent um and you can get that and so that's another way to um, invest you can do that passively in real estate um distressed debt is another category so that's when you buy non-performing notes potentially um and there's there's a lot within that distressed debt category but oftentimes people are buying non-performing notes at a huge discount and they're getting them to be performing or reworking them somehow and then selling them or just holding them to um, as performing notes that they got at a major discount. So um, those are some of the major buckets in the residential category. And one of the main differences between residential and commercial is that residential is still correlated with the overall economy. And that's because it's correlated with the single family home um, market overall. And um, so what I mean by that is that with commercial real estate, it's looked at more as of a business and um, it's looked at, it's treated more like a business, right? And so you can invest in businesses that perform well during downturns um, and you can invest in 
deals in, in companies that are able to weather the storm um, because it's a business that can continue to cash flow. And then when the storm has passed, then values will you know continue to rise and you can sell at an opportune time. So commercial real estate is that is the main difference is that it's non-correlated. It's based valued based on a cap rate. And a cap rate is essentially a measure of um value. And like if you were to buy a million dollar property and it produced fifty thousand dollars of income of net operating income, then it would be um you ha- would have bought it at a five cap. That's 5% of a million dollars. So um, cap rate basically means that the property is being valued on the income that it's producing. And so if you think about it, there's industries that do well during recessions and there's industries that do well um, during downturns and during volatility. Self-storage does really well in volatility. Um, multifamily is something that people always need a place to live. So there are industries that you can exist in that do well, even during a downturn. And that's like a critical component of commercial real estate investing. Um, And then, you know, there's also some miscellaneous categories, tax liens and raw land. Um, So, all right, with that, we're going to go to the looking at commercial. So this is passive real estate investing in the commercial space. So within this, there are many categories and most of them, we're going to put them here, are multifamily, retail, industrial, which also includes self-storage, hospitality, short-term rental fund, low-income housing, student housing, senior housing, mobile home parks. So multifamily is apartments, retail is like maybe a strip mall, although it could be you know a lot of other things. Um, industrials like warehouses, self-storage would, you know, fall into this category. Just why well, I, I don't have another box for it, but um, it can fall into this because sometimes those properties are combined. Um, next, we've got hospitality. So that'd be more like a hotels. And then there's also the ability to get into a short-term rental fund um, that's operated more like a business rather than manage, you know, one-off, um, one-off. And uh Then we've got low-income housing. So there's lots of ways to invest in low-income housing that are fairly complex, but, you know, it is possible. Student housing is a big category. Senior housing with a silver tsunami is another big category. Mobile homes is another, you know, important risk-adjusted category because mobile home parks are really affordable um, housing. They are a great way to provide four walls for a family who, you know, maybe wouldn't be able to afford that otherwise. So... Um, that is just an overview of what kinds of deals you're going to see when you see deals come across your desk. Personally, I like to focus on multifamily, industrial, self-storage. We have a short-term rental offering, which is really interesting, um, and mobile home parks. So those are my favored ones, although, you know, there is possibility for doing, um, any of these at some point if they meet my criteria. Okay, so now let's talk about risk versus returns. And within any one of those categories, you can have a core, core plus value at opportunistic development or distressed deal. So what does that mean? So a distressed deal would be, um, let's say we're just talking about apartments. So a distressed deal would be a deal where um, it's like in really bad shapes, maybe 50% occupied in an apartment complex. There's crime. People don't really go out of their house of their apartments very much. It doesn't really feel safe when you walk on the property and there's pe- police are there a lot and you know it's a crime ridden place. Mm-hmm. So that's a distressed deal. You can buy that and turn that around. Um, it takes a lot of time and there is risk associated with it because it takes time to turn around a tenant base. It takes time to you know weed out um, so the crime elements in the property. But it can be very gratifying because you can um, really take a place from a place where people are not going outside to a place where the kids are playing and people are being outside and it feels like home. And, you know, that's a really amazing thing to do for families is to provide safe, clean, affordable housing for them. So that would be an example of a distress deal. Um, A development deal would be building new housing. We have a vast shortage of housing in this country, so we need more 
um, people to do development. At the same time, it's risky because there, I mean, there's more risk because there's timeline risk and there's cost overruns. Um, and there's just more risk with that when it comes to construction and permitting, et cetera. So development is a category that would be, you know, you would, you should expect higher returns and more risk. Opportunistic is kind of the next strategy where perhaps there is an ability to add more units to an existing property. So there's a little bit of development risk, but you also have an existing property that's cash flowing and performing. Value add is a place where we end up spending a lot of time and opportunistic because, for example, we'll buy a self storage facility and then we will add um, square footage to that facility. So that's kind of a mix of value add and opportunistic. Value add is when you take, like, let's say it's we're back to apartments, take like a 1980s built apartment in an affordable market, and then renovate the in interiors, renovate the exteriors, and make it so that it is really, um, you know, an attractive place to live. You can bump the rents, you can make the property more efficient and optimize the operations. And um, that, and you can add ancillary income streams. The whole point is to bump the net operating income. So that's value add. Core plus and core are more, um, you take, you're taking stabilized assets. Core plus is maybe where you're going to just be doing small tweaks to it, but it's already stabilized and it's already mostly at market rate. And core is really where you just plan on buying the asset and there's really not much more you you would do to optimize it. And this is often a space that you know institutions will invest in core assets a lot because they are not operators and they just want to protect their wealth. That's oftentimes the reason people invest in these types of deals is it's great for wealth preservation because the investment is backed by a hard asset. Okay, and now we're gonna talk about income versus growth. So a lot of investors prefer income and some prefer growth, right? So that's usually investors kind of want one more than the other. Um, it's nice to have a little bit of both, but usually investors are more, more focused on one versus the other. So you, when people want income, it's usually because they are, they've already developed their nest egg and they want to turn their portfolio into cash flow. Um, I also always want to buy investments that cash flow, but I'm more focused on growth. So I'm more focused on making sure that we're hitting those high equity multiples, like a 2X equity multiple in five years. That's like a typical projection that you'll see. Um, and we believe that usually, you know, that that is a conservative investment. So income versus growth. Let's say, I just want to give you an example. So for in investors that are wanting to create cash flow for them to live off of, I usually suggest that 10% is about what they would get because we oftentimes there's a, a tranche, there's a type of investment, it's called preferred equity, that you can do in these passive investing real estate deals where you're getting about a 10% coupon. So what that would look like is if you put $100,000 in, you would get $10,000 every year, probably paid out on a quarterly basis. And then, you know, let's say we sold the deal in five years, and then at that point, you would get your $100,000 back, but you wouldn't get any equity appreciation. If you are more interested in growth, you would probably get the common equity shares. And in that case, you would probably be getting variable cash flow, maybe four to eight percent. It could go higher than that, um, and it could go lower than that. But you know that would be the range at which you would probably be getting cash flow during the whole period. And then um, at the end of the whole period, you'd sell, we'd sell the deal, and you get a big chunk back as well. And you know when you combine the cash flow plus the appreciation from sale, that would equal a twenty percent average annual return as a projection. So. Um, for people who are younger and they're really trying to get their income to snowball and their wealth to snowball, they'll probably be more interested in growth. Uh, people who are uber, uber motivated to grow their wealth are going to need to figure out how to earn more money and then put that money to work in the most efficient way possible. And there's so many tools out there to do that. Um, I focus on passive real estate investing because I know the space really well. I feel very comfortable in it. And because, you know, it hits my sweet spot for risk versus return. So um, that's all I wanted to cover today. Just to sum up, um, I'll go back a couple slides. The ultra wealthy tend to invest, you know, about 50% of their portfolio in um, these three deck, these three buckets, passive real estate, venture capital, and hedge funds. And the average investor is actually severely under allocated to these funds. The average investor has only 5% of their portfolio allocated to these types of deals. So, um, you know, my goal is to make the world of alternative investing approachable 
so that people can feel confident moving their money, uh, moving some of their money from the stocks, bonds, and mutual funds world into uh, passive real estate. That's where my sweet spot is. But you know, it's important to know about all of the about the other buckets as well. So I have a passion for um, helping the average person build their wealth. And, um, you know, even people who are really good at earning don't necessarily always know how to put their money to work in these sophisticated ways. And so that is uh, one of my goals. So thank you so much. I'm sorry, I forgot to record the actual conversation, but I think we covered most of the ground here. And if you are interested, please make sure to reach out to me, sujata at luxe-cap.com. And I'd love to hear from you and just hear what's on your mind as far as investing. And, um, you know, if you want to have a call, then I'm sure we can carve out some time in our busy schedules to make sure that we connect and see if there's, uh, you know, any questions that I can answer, if this might be something you want to learn more about. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching this and I will see you next time.